modern tools and techniques uh, which are used in the uh, research of fields of biological sciences uh, going on uh, around the world uh, today. Uh, and uh, for that, uh, we are inviting eminent scientists uh, to deliver their works and to uh, share their experiences and uh, ideas with uh, all of us and our students for us. And uh, fortuitously, uh, along with our students, we are also uh, getting uh, a number of participants from other colleges, uh, students, and other colleges, uh, universities, as well as research institutions uh, from different corners of uh, our country. Uh, today, uh, also, uh, we are fortunate uh, to have some participants from uh, the University of Burdwan, uh, Visvavarthi University, and other colleges uh, also. Uh, as uh, Dr. Jackie told, that uh, today is our eighth lecture in this uh, bioluminescent uh, series. Uh, and today we are having with us uh, as the speaker, uh, Dr. Joydeep Chakraborty uh, from the University of Tokyo. Uh, who will be delivering his talk uh, on green chemistry and the role of microbes. Uh, so not wasting much time, uh, on behalf of the Department of Biological Sciences of Aliyah University, uh, I am uh, uh, formally welcoming you all uh, uh, to this uh, lecture, especially Dr. Uh, Jaydeep Chakraborty uh, for today's lecture. And uh, also I want to express uh, my heartfelt gratitude to all of you uh, for bearing with us and uh, making our events so successful. Uh, thank you all. And uh, now, uh, before starting our today, uh, let me uh, give a brief introduction of the speaker. Uh, Dr. Chakraborty uh, have done his graduation in chemistry uh, from Assam University, and then uh, he had chosen uh, biochemistry and uh, done his uh, post-graduation in biochemistry from uh, the University of Calcutta. Thereafter, uh, Dr. Chakraborty uh, joined as a PhD uh, scholar in the Department of Microbiology of Bose, Bose Institute, Kolkata, in 2005, and completed his PhD in 2010. Uh, then uh, he has also worked uh, for uh, more than four years as a research associate uh, in the same institute, uh, that is Bose Institute uh, of Kolkata. And then uh, he got in 2015 uh, one of the most prestigious uh, postdoctoral award uh, in the field of uh, research, uh, the JSPS award from uh, Japan. And he uh, he have started his postdoctoral uh, research in the uh, University of Tokyo in 2015 with the JSPS fellowship. Uh, then in 2017 uh, he got. Uh, a tenure track faculty position as a uh, research assistant professor in 2017 uh, in the center of University of Tokyo uh, of uh, Japan and uh, still he is working there as uh, the assistant professor uh, in the depart department. So uh, let's move on to the uh, lecture uh, and I will request uh, Dr. Chakraborty to uh, start his uh, lecture. So over to you Dr. Chakraborty. Yeah, uh... First of all, I would like to, uh, am I audible by the way? Yes, yes, ah, okay. yes. Yeah, so first of all, uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Masrur Alam for the introduction, as well as Dr. Uh, Safdur Ali and, and Dr. Uh, Zakir for inviting me uh, to this uh, beautiful lecture uh, and this talk today. So uh, I'm really glad to be a part of this, uh, you know, bio, uh, bio illumination series hosted by Aliba University. And uh, if I'm not wrong, as you said, that is the eighth lecture today. I've been following uh, some of the previous lectures as well. So uh, let me first begin with uh, my slides. Just let me. Just a moment.
is the slide visible by the way uh, no dr uh, yeah yeah it's coming okay 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 the slides are not visible uh, yeah. okay just just let me check again I hope now it is right. Yeah, it's coming. It's visible. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, sorry, because I'm not much used to with uh, you know this uh, Google Meet <laughs> because we here mostly are using Zoom these days. Anyway, so uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Alam has already introduced about the talk that I will be giving, so uh, so. I will uh, divide my uh, talk basically into two parts. First is uh, I would uh, like to introduce a little bit about what exactly is green chemistry and how uh, microbes come into play a uh, role in this green chemistry. And then after talking uh, uh, about a little bit introductory part, I will go to uh, some real life experiments and, and the way uh, we do uh, this kind of green chemistry uh, in our practical experimental labs. So uh, to begin with, okay, uh, in the the, uh, the second half of 20th century has actually seen an accelerated progress in science and technology, and we all know that uh, uh, we have heard about and we have read about industrial revolution. Yeah, indeed, this has brought significant economic development. We all know, and uh, this has increased the living standard, especially in those uh, uh, like develop developed parts of the world. But with economic development came considerable amount of environmental degradation as well, manifested by pronounced climatic change, emergence of, uh, for example, say ozone holes, accumulation of uh, this kind of uh, uh, recalcitrant organic pollutants in all parts of the biosphere. And these days, uh, the, the entire scientific world is uh, gradually becoming aware of these things. So such a situation requires a search for a solution to balance the use of uh, natural resources at the very first place, along with economic growth and as well as the environmental con um, uh, conservation. So, okay, yeah. So uh, when we talk about economic development, the things that first comes into our mind are these three, that is the climate change, uh, ozone holes, and this uh, accumulation of these kind of compounds. So, but why so? That is the uh, most important question. We have uh, seen that uh, chemistry is, is almost uh, everywhere and uh, it's, it's uh, needless to say in what aspects of our daily lives we use chemistry in different uh, ways. So these industrial processes that we, I was just showing about, uh, so the processes on an industrial scale, they involve, involve several various versatile chemical reactions and which huge use wide, uh, rather to say, wide variety of uh, molecules, reagents, solvents, acids, and, and so on. So these chemical processes, they not, not only they produce the required products that we actually uh, intend to produce, but at the same time, they also produce as a byproduct large amounts of undesired and harmful or rather toxic substances. They can be the solid forms uh, or in a liquid form or sometimes even in uh, the form of gases. So, uh, can we just imagine a world in which, uh, for example, say, uh, instead of toxic solvents and chemicals, industrial manufacturing uses uh, compounds like sugar, starch, and sunlight as inputs? Or say, uh, what if uh, the industrial chemicals were bio-based and were generated by farmers, say, practicing sustainable agriculture? And then say, products that are manufactured uh, in, in these factories, they biodegrade into utterly benign substances uh, or, or, or let's say imagine uh, just pure clean water leaving the factories which is very much in contrary to the, the one of the slides that i showed a, a 
couple of slides back. So clean water, living factories, and and uh, this way polluted sources brought back into life. For example, the water and the and the landfills that we see all around these days. So can we imagine this kind of place where we work free of hazmat gears, that is hazardous material gears, factories without scrubbers, and so on? A world where carbon dioxide is uh, used as a vast valuable industrial input uh, rather than being used as uh, or being emitted as a greenhouse gas and polluting this environment. So although all these that I've been talking about, this uh, sound more like a dream, but green chemistry indeed is making this vision a reality and we will see soon uh, how uh, this was the term actually this green chemistry which is very much used these days was actually co uh, coined by an scientist called anastas in 1991 that is the early 1990s so to begin with let's first see what exactly is green chemistry so over the last two decades this green chemistry has rapidly become an important area of chemical sciences so now what exactly green chemistry is it is the utilization of a set of principles this is very important to understand that is it is a set of protocols and principles which are intended to reduce the use and generation of hazardous compounds and while talking about this we should be very much clear that the, that, that the aim of green chemistry is not at all cleaning of the environment rather the main intention here is to invent new chemical processes that do not further pollute the environment because sometimes people often compare green uh, i mean confuse green chemistry with uh, uh, you know uh, environmental uh, i mean uh, cleaning of the environment but it actually isn't it's rather uh, developing processes which do not further or which stop us further uh, polluting the, the the environment so yeah so uh, although there are several aspects of green chemistry uh, and and there are actually 12 to be precise uh, today i will focus only into these three that is safer chemical synthesis renewable raw materials how we can use them and finally catalysis so let's begin with the key question that why gas prices are so high because why i'm talking about gas because it's the one of the most widely used renewable raw material that we know uh, until now so the question is why gas prices are so high obviously we all know that it is uh, a renewable resource which makes it so much expensive but another important thing is which we many of uh, us might not be aware is that 90 to 95 of the products that we use in our everyday life, everyday life for example, say plastic bottles, paint, pharmaceutical, everything that we use in our day-to-day uh, -day life, these come from oil or rather this petroleum oil. And this is the reason why, which makes uh, this uh, gas prices or natural oil prices so high. Now the next million dollar dollar question that comes to our mind is what will happen when we run out of these petroleum oil and petroleum resources? And we all know that uh, sooner or later this day is, 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 uh, has to come, right? The solution is biomass. What is biomass? It is the in, in, a very, uh, in, a, in a very simple way. We can define it as the plant material which is generated from photosynthesis but the interesting thing is this biomass is a leading candidate to replace petroleum as a feedstock for the organic chemistry industry now uh, talking a little bit about how biomass can be uh, can be can be used uh, in a very short way i would like to uh, highlight the points taking certain examples uh, of biomasses that are or can be used for example let's begin with carbohydrate this is the biomass that we all know that is is produced initially from uh, as glucose from water uh, and carbon dioxide during photosynthesis it is contained in the structural parts of plants as cellulose which we all we all, we all know that is a biopolymer next comes lignin which is very important because it is also a biopolymer which with a much complex uh, structure which occurs uh, with cellulose in woody parts of the plants and they are mostly involved in binding fibers of uh, uh, they play a role in binding the fibers of cellulose together but relatively very few uses have been found for lignin although it has very huge potential but relatively until now very few uh, processes have been developed using lignin and because it poses impurity problems uh, during extraction methods uh, while extracting cellulose for feedstock use 
Next comes uh, lipid. Lipidos, uh, which can be extracted from seeds, including like soybeans, sunflowers, corn, etc., can also be used as biomass, although this also is not uh, widely used or extensively used these days. Hydrocarbon terpenes. This can be another option, and, and in fact, people are uh, working a lot these days on these kind of terpenes uh, because these terpenes, they, they, they are produced by rubber trees, pine trees, and some other kinds of plants, so they are readily available and have very huge potential to be used as uh, uh, useful biomass. And finally, to some extent, proteins, because, you know, uh, these proteins are uh, produced in relatively small quantities, although, but they are potentially valuable as nutrients uh, and some other uses as well. So, when uh, now let's talk about carbohydrate. And when whenever we talk about carbohydrate, uh, the first thing that comes to our mind is, of course, glucose. So the glucose molecule, uh, it provides a promising platform uh, for a number of different organic synthesis uh, synthetic steps. Uh, in addition to being produced uh, in abundance by plants, it also contains these kind of hydro hydroxyl groups, which is very important because these act as sites for attachment of various other functional groups, which makes glucose so much useful uh, for, uh, for many purposes. Uh, this glucose is metabolized by essentially all organisms, we know that, and so it serves as an excellent starting point for biosynthetic reactions using enzymes and uh, it or many of its products are, uh, inter are are biodegradable which is also very interesting and very important uh, um, in environmental perspective adding to their environmental acceptability and finally it can be obtained by enzyme catalyzed processes from uh, say other sugars including sucrose and fructose so virtually all the glucose you know uh, uh, that is now used uh, these days in, in in different applications is actually obtained from the enzymatic hydrolysis of cornstarch this is very interesting it also it is also possible to obtain glucose by the enzymatic hydrolysis, uh, hydrolysis of cellulose now, the next thing is glucose, uh, although it is widely used as a starting material for uh, biological synthesis of, of, of actually numerous uh, uh, different biochemical compounds. Uh, to, to name a few, for example, say, uh, uh, how to say, these include uh, this kind of ascorbic espor acids, lactic acids. In some, in some instances, they can be used, it can be used for uh, synthesis of several amino acids, uh, which can be, uh, used as nutritional supplements and also it can be used uh, for example uh, for synthesis of uh, certain vitamins uh, that are also made biochemically from uh, glucose so the greatest use of glucose however apart from these things uh, is the synthesis uh, glucose for synthesis is a fermentation to produce ethanol why it is important because this ethanol is widely used as a gasoline additive as a solvent and as a chemical feedstock, which actually uh, makes glucose rather very much important. Now, let's come to the point where microbes come into action into this this green chemistry. Because until now we have been talking about I've been talking about what exactly is green chemistry and uh, how uh, feedstock can be used. Uh, but now, uh, uh, in line with uh, the topic of my today's, uh, the, the title of my topic, that how microbes come into action here. Let's, let's uh, take one example. For example, adipic acid. It is a feedstock which is consumed in large quantities to make nylon. Uh, now, uh, the conventional synthesis of this adipic acid, acid, acid starts from benzene, as you can see here. And this benzene we know is a volatile, flammable hydrocarbon that is believed to cause leukemia in in, in humans. So we can understand how, uh, how how risky and how and un environmentally unfriendly this process can be. This in this synthesis, as you can see in this slide, involves several steps using catalysis at high pressure, corrosive oxidant, nitric acid, and above all, during the throughout the process. At elevated temperatures, say for example, uh, around 250 degrees centigrade is used, and this nitric acid, uh, this nitrous acid that is released, accounts for a significant accumulation of uh, this pollutant gas in, in the whole world. As an alternative to the chemical synthesis that we just saw uh, in our previous slide of of adipic acid, a biological synthetic synthesis uh, synthetic step 
which uh, implementing say for example a, a modified or genetically engineered e coli and a simple hydrogenation reaction has been devised this bacteria can convert glucose to cis cis muconic acid and uh, the muconic acid is then treated at relatively mild conditions with hydrogen under, uh, if, if I'm not wrong, it's around like two or three atmospheric pressure uh, over a catalyst, say, say, say for example, platinum catalyst to give uh, adipic acid. So you can just see that how this environmentally unfriendly and toxic steps, chemical steps can be replaced with a milder and eco-friendly uh, 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 biological process. And this is how green chemistry actually works. Now, uh, okay, yeah. So this cellulose, again, for uh, taking another example, uh, we know the cellulose uh, is the most abundant natural biopolymer in the world, which makes actually uh, uh, the, the, the highest amount of uh, biomass uh, resource in the world. Most cellulose uh, we know are produced in plants, which uh, is basically huge in, in, in amount. And out of that, wood is about uh, wood accounts for at least forty percent of cellulose. Leaf fibers lead to seventy percent, and cotton about ninety-five percent. So cotton, in fact, is a very rich uh, source of cellulose. Uh, it also differs uh, occurs in different forms and is always associated with usually hemicellulose and lignin. Now, this cellulose that I, I'm talking about, it bonds uh, with the degree of poly with various degree of polymerization uh, to the in the in the native wood. So the next thing is the first step uh, to you to for the cellulose to be used as biomass is actually uh, this is a picture just, just a basic, basic uh, very basic uh, pictorial representation of how the the workflow of how cellulose it can be used as a biofuel and indeed is being used uh, in, in, in an industrial scale. So the first step. Uh, is that the biomass is harvested from from natural environment, thereby de delivering uh, uh, delivering it to the biomass uh, refinery. Thereafter, the biomass is cut into shreds and then pre-treated with heat and chemical to make the cellulose accessible for enzymes. Because then we will be moving towards enzymatic uh, uh, microbial enzymes. So first, we need to cut shred them and then make it accessible to enzymes. Then finally, the enzymes in a, in, in a fermentation tank. They break down the cellulose chains into sugars, which uh, uh, I'm, I was sorry. Actually, this then is followed by uh, transferring the contents to, uh, to this fermentation tank, where the microbes ferment this sugar into ethanol. And obviously, because this is crude ethanol, so it has to be purified through distillation, uh, and then it is ready for uh, distribution, as you can see here. So this is the in, in a very basic uh, way. This is how uh, the the uh, biomass, uh, like uh, uh, bioethanol, is produced from biomass, and can be uh, and actually is being used these days. And we know that in various countries, including uh, our own country, uh, are different blends of uh, bioethanol uh, are these days being used along with the, the natural uh, oil. Okay, so now moving on. Large quantities of cellulose-rich waste biomass are actually generated as byproducts for crop production in the form of straw. Okay, so one way in which this can be done is by the enzyme, uh, you know, this enzymatic breakdown of cellulose into glucose and sugars that I was just uh, showing in our previous slide, and directly used as a, as a feedstock or fermented to produce ethanol. So fortunately, uh, okay, so direct conversion of cellulose waste to, feed, to feedstock uh, okay, uh, can be another route. But fortunately, nature has uh, provided us with efficient microorganisms for this purpose. So we can use enzyme systems to break down the cellulose down into glucose sugar and uh, use, which can be used directly as a feedstock uh, or can be fermented to produce bioethanol. Now taking an example of bioplastics. Uh, many of us, we know that uh, uh, it would be ideal to have polymers that are made of uh, microorganisms, say polyhydroxyalkylates or PAS, that we commonly call them. Call them. They are thermoplastic. They have, interestingly, they have thermoplastic properties. That is, they melt when heated. And again, when we cool them, they resolidify into their previous shape. So this this feature or this phenomena actually 
uh, is very useful because this is called the plastic property and the thermoplastic property is very rare in biological materials so that makes ph um, or fuzz very important uh, for industrial applications and apart from their uh, biodegradability they have hydroxy groups on their hydrocarbon chains that can be engineered to further uh, you know generate different kinds of varieties uh, um, uh, of uh, to produce different kind of rubber like plastics and we can also prepare solid uh, plastics. So I would like to add here that uh, in 1923, uh, I think, yeah, it was around 1923, that some kind of bacteria were found that can store this polyhydroxy alkanase or FAS. These, kind, these are actually ester polymers, uh, which are res uh, stored as uh, food and energy reserves in, in, within the cells. So in 1980s, it was shown that these materials have this kind of uh, you know plastic properties it was found in 1980s and therefore these fast compounds are amenable to biological attacks that is they easily easily can be attacked uh, for example you can see that there is an ester link uh, in, in between the polymeric linkage so enzymes can attack here and degrade these plastics and that is how this becomes biodegradable so here you can see there is an image where uh, this is a phd bottle and uh, within like uh, maybe if i'm not wrong three months or something this plastic bottle was completely degraded as you can see here so this was uh, this the images were taken at different time intervals so you can understand how uh, useful this can be if we can bring them that into our day-to-day -day applications so this is another example of you know uh, biocatalysis so i won't go much into 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 the details of this uh, of this reaction but what i would like to focus here is why enzymes are important you see because we know that enzymes are very much stereo specific they are very much stereo uh, selective for example they won't uh, for, for example, just uh, to, to define this, let's say this, uh, here you can see that uh, from benzene, we are trying to form, uh, prepare or synthesize catechol industrially or chemically. But along with catechol, we also end up with uh, compounds like hydroquinone or benzoquinone as such. So these are obviously impurities and we, uh, we do not desire to, to come up with this kind of impurities, right? So here comes enzymes because they are very much stereo selective. So if they are producing catechol, they will produce catechol only and no enantiomers. Similarly, they are very much selective in terms of their uh, selective and specific in terms of their, how to say, uh, substrate uh, preferences. So this makes enzymes a very interesting candidates in, in industrial application. So this is just a continuation of the previous slide uh, of how uh, comparing just this kind of industrial or chemical processes with few steps of engineered uh, uh, um, I mean, microbial steps where we can easily get this catechol from glucose. So this is a pathway of catechol biosynthesis from benzene, which is very common among, uh, among microbes. So this was part of uh, pretty much introduction about the green chemistry, uh, an overview uh, which I, I wanted to share with you. Now let's come to the practical application and how we uh, get the things done when we when we do the things in our laboratory so this green chemistry is not only one subject rather uh, it is basically an ensemble of say multidisciplinary approach towards identification of novel enzymes from the nature so now let me explain a little bit more uh, for example you can see that uh, here microbiology comes into action chemistry mathematics information technology or what we call like, like informatics so all of them come together and work together to find novel enzymes that can be used for green chemistry okay so let's begin with microbiology how, how, how uh, we do things here the microbiological approach that we follow is called enrichment enrichment culture method whereby we enrich or we culture different environmental samples say for example uh, as you can see here soil samples to various selection media and then we come up with some consortia or some kind of bacterial isolates and then we try to identify some isolates or some bacteria which have the highest potential of degrading that kind of compounds because we enrich them always usually in presence of some kind of compound that we want to degrade so the, the most potential enzyme, uh, the potential bacteria, we try to isolate them 
to identify and uh, try to characterize the bacteria. And then what we do is that we either uh, do degradation pathway analysis, which comprises of biochemical and analytic methods. We often, uh, these days, most importantly, we always, uh, almost always go for genomic analysis of the bacteria. And in some cases, if needed, if we see that, yes, this bacteria indeed has very huge potential, then we go for genetic engineering processes. So what kind of bi biochemical analysis, when, we, when I say biochemical analysis, it actually in, comprises of, say, uh, methods like, uh, you know, the, the, the how to say, uh, this solvent extraction methods or different chromatographical methods like TLC or HPLC or spectroscopy like uh, mass pigmentation, like gas chromatography along with mass uh, spectroscopy. Or in many cases, for identification of new compounds, we use NMR as well. Okay, so apart from that, another important aspect is the genomic analysis, whereby we uh, try to search for molecular signature in our isolates. Uh, this has really become, uh, you know, uh, easier these days uh, with the advent of genomic sequences analysis. So now, these days it has become very easy to get a uh, microbial genome getting get sequenced, and then we can. And there are lots of, uh, you know, plenty of uh, informatics tools available these days. So we can just have the genome sequence in our hand. We can do mathematical analysis, statistical analysis, and can come up with some lead. Uh, genes. Lead genes means some genes which we know that have the potential and can be used for this kind of applications. Then what we do? Next comes, uh, you know, either enzyme or metabolic pathway engineering, where we, once the genes have been identified, we try to, you know, either we try to, uh, uh, how to say, uh, get them heterologously expressed, or sometimes we uh, tend to knock the genes, uh, knock down the genes, and see the the, the physiological, uh, you know, uh, properties of the genes. And this way, we come up with identification of novel genes. And from novel genes, we go to the novel enzymes, which have potential uh, industrial or environmental aspects of green chemistry. Okay, so now. Coming to exactly what uh, I've been doing in over the years. Uh, so what I did was I began with identify recalcitrant aromatic compounds, uh, basically aromatic hydrocarbon degraders or degraders from polluted environmental sources, which with an aim of generating certain engineered uh, enzymes or engineered uh, uh, microbes, which can be used for bioremediation. And when I am uh, showing this slide, be sure that no way we can reach a uh, stage where this kind of uh, scenery can be changed to this kind. We haven't reached uh, that uh, to that you know accuracy yet. Uh, so this is just to uh, uh, to sh show the the idea behind this kind of research. Now, I've been uh, working with uh, or rather the gene of interest that I was working was uh, working with was is called risky oxygenase, as you can see the name here. Uh, this risky name came from the, the scientists who discovered this enzyme. So this is basically a multi-component enzyme system where uh, there is a reductase which receives the electron from some reducing agent and then passes on this electron to an intermediate ferrodoxin. So this ferrodoxin shuttles between this reductase and the terminal oxygenase. So this terminal oxygenase is actually the enzyme which does this process. So this enzyme basically transforms, uh, hydroxylates uh, some kind of aromatic compound. And I am, I was, I've always been interested in this risky oxygenase for one reason, basically two reasons, because the beauty and significance of this enzyme family is, is the wide spectrum of substrates that it is capable of transforming. And the versatility of different kinds of oxygen, oxygenation reactions that it does, for example, lateral dioxination, vicinal dioxination, uh, monohydroxylation, uh, demethylation, angular dioxination, so a lot of, basically it does hydroxylation, but different ways and in different positions, which makes this, this uh, enzyme system very much uh, important, uh, both industrially as well as environmentally. So what I did, we studied the, the evolutionary pathway of all the, the, the biochemically risky oxygenases which have been characterized until now. So we did the, the different phylogenetic studies, some, uh, some evolutionary studies, and we finally came up with, uh, you know, uh, like we, came, we, we, we proposed a mathematical model to depict the evolution of this enzymatic, this enzyme family. 
of, because it's a huge family and there are hundreds of enzymes which have been already uh, characterized to uh, so this I, I won't go into the details or explain i would like to explain this i won't like to uh, explain this mathematical uh, model right now but uh, i just want to share the, the 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 message that this model can be used for any other similar multi-component enzyme family and this we named this traceback method where we look at the current or existing enzymes and looking at the existing enzymes, we date back or we go back to their previous parental stage, uh, which is hypothetical, and then further to the grandparental stage. And from that, we try to understand how this enzyme system actually, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, how to say, how it, it evolved in nature. And this way, the intention behind all this is that uh, we use those information to model and identify new risky oxygenases from the environment for our uh, candidate substrates or desired substrates of interest. And this is what we did here also. And we went on to characterize some previously uncharacterized uh, risky oxygenases based on this model that we had developed. And of course, and such kind of theoretical predictions are always, uh, they always need to be validated. So always, uh, this is a common practice that we come up with some theoretical predictions about, okay, this enzyme can uh, transform such and such compounds. These enzymes can transform such and such compounds. So this is just a theoretical model. And what we do is that next we try to, uh, to validate our, uh, our uh, theory by experimentations, where we actually try to see, for example, here we see that it's a naphthalene uh, dioxinase, which we identified and it was capable of transforming indole into indigo just thus uh, turning uh, the culture entire culture very very, very dark blue and uh, so these things and then these are associated with as i had already previously uh, showed in one of the slides with uh, various uh, you know analytical biochemical tools like gcms hplc and so on so this is how we characterize some enzymes. And while doing that, because we already had come up with a numerous, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, risky oxygenases, that was the time when we decided that why not make a common platform, a kind of database. So these studies actually inspired us to construct a database. And it's not actually just a database. It's also, also a, a prediction server dedicated to risky oxygenases. The name is called ROBIS. That means Ring Hydroxylating Oxygenase Database, which is still being hosted by Bose Institute. And uh, uh, this, 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 this platform is currently is widely being used among researchers uh, throughout the world who are working with risky oxygenases. So what we do is that Either you uh, give your query sequence and this database will uh, give you what kind of uh, chemicals this enzyme can, uh, can transform, or you can draw the structure of a chemical. Uh, you, you can give the sequence of a chemical, uh, of a uh, newly you say, sequenced risky oxygenase. And this database will give you back uh, and, and the prediction of what kind of compounds this enzyme might uh, transform. So this is how this, uh, this, this, uh, this engine works. So we uh, currently are using, uh, we are doing some industrial collaborations uh, where we are extensively using uh, this database and, and, and the information of this risky oxygenases which we have been uh, accumulating since over the years. So until now, all the risky oxygenases that we have been studying were uh, from mesophiles, mesophilic bacteria. So next, my research, uh, my research interest shifted towards understanding such enzymes in thermophilic bacteria. Now, why thermophiles? That is because you see uh, thermophiles. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is just a table to show uh, that uh, how many kinds of uh, different risky oxygenase homologs we find found in different uh, sequence genomes. So uh, out of like that time, it was uh, more than 3,000, uh, uh, you know, sequence genomes, out of which 110 were completed thermophilic genomes. Out of that, uh, in all of them, there were 672 protein candidates that we found could be used as potential risky uh, thermostable risky oxygenases. So why I got interested towards thermostable enzymes? Because we know that thermostable enzymes are always desired in industrial processes, you know, especially those which take place at very high temperatures. The, 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 I mean, the industrial processes which take place at very high temperatures. And the reasons are pretty much known that uh, 
these thermostable enzymes or we often call them thermozymes are desired tools for industrial processes and uh, they are often uh, you know resistance to proteolysis as well as chemical denaturants detergents solvents etc so what was the idea behind our research was that usually people uh, while uh, looking for gene, uh, new enzymes they start from scratch going to the environment and uh, isolating new strains and then uh, trying to find out uh, if they these organisms have any enzymes or not but uh, what we did was we took a different kind of uh, approach where we uh, uh, you know, like we made equal efforts to search novel enzymes in these kind of already existing genome sequences because we know now that uh, in, in NCBI, for example, the, the submitted genome sequences are exponentially increasing almost every every day, rather, not every month. So why not harvest uh, the information or extract the information already existing in the, in, in the database and use it for our purpose? This way, we actually came up with a lot of risky oxygenases that are present in, 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 in uh, different thermophiles. So, as I already had mentioned, that uh, these risky oxygenases are very much important because they attack the inert aromatic nucleus, they are regio and stereo specific in nature, and uh, very various you know biotransformation steps are usually done at very high temperatures. So uh, when the temperature is very high this also enables uh, um, like uh, the, also makes the the compounds more soluble because of high, enhanced uh, solubility because of higher temperatures and this solubility actually enhances the the degradability of such aromatic compounds so these kind of enzymes are always desired what caught our attention was it was the presence of a unique reductase uh, oxidoreductase gene cluster in one of the plasmids uh, of one of the bacteria that we, we have been uh, studying because it was isolated in great basin uh, offspring united states actually it's in, uh, uh, in nevada uh, so in one of the plasmids we came up uh, we came across with a very very, very unique uh, uh, you see pathway so i won't again go into details of this pathway because that would be too much to talk about in, in, in one lecture so just to give an overview uh, we did uh, what we call it like uh, uh, metabolic pathway mapping so we did this, uh, this pathway ma mapping and came up with uh, so we had this uh, you know this entire sequence we had the genome sequence out of which this entire plasmid this is a mega plasmid whose uh, genome sequence is also known so we did this pathway mapping and came up with the most possible pathways to which these can these genes can be affiliated which the oxaloreductase gene that i was talking about so out of that we found some very interesting candidates uh, one of them was a decarboxylase and a risky oxygenase I'm, I'm not showing the the risky oxygenase here because we are still studying uh, the the enzyme system very ex extensively but the one that uh, we already have studied to, to a good extent is a decarboxylase gene which is very thermostable and we have found activity even at 90 degrees you see 70 degrees is the most optimum temperature for activity of this decarboxylase this is a protocatitude decarboxylase a very novel enzyme but you can see it it can act even in 90 de degrees so you can just imagine that if a reaction process is taking place uh, taking place at a, at a temperature like 90 or say 100 degree how this enzyme can be useful and what we did was uh, after suspecting this enzyme we just knocked it out and we found that yes indeed the enzyme activity was lost so now the question is why why we got interested in this kind of uh, you know enzyme because as i already mentioned that uh, is we suspect or, or what we have found that it is actually very novel uh, thermostable protocatitude decarboxylase this enzyme has a very promising industrial application where in the production of muconic and adipic acid so from lignin which can be used as a biomass we can produce muconic acid and adipic acid and these muconic and adipic acids have very wide array of you know uh, industrial applications so this these are very commonly used in a lot of uh, as an intermediate in, in, in a lot of different uh, uh, biosynthetic pathways 
so and and, and for to generate compounds which we uh, use almost every day so this is just uh, this was just an overview and an example to see how to show how uh, this kind of you know uh, enzymes can be uh, what kind of you know green chemistry strategies we can take and how we can uh, combine you know bioinformatics and so as biochemistry, microbiology, uh, genetic engineering together to, to, to finally come up with some kind of potential enzymes which have, I mean, some kind of uh, candidate enzymes which have, which can have potential industrial or environmental applications. So this is what I wanted to convey in today's talk. So at the final uh, slide, I would like to introduce uh, my lab, we call it the Laboratory of Environmental Biochemistry, and in Japanese we call it Kampo, and so this is the University of Tokyo main building. And uh, I am working uh, in the laboratory of Professor Hideki Nojiri. So Professor Nojiri is one of uh, the very eminent scientists in the field of environmental microbiology, and he's been working uh, in this field uh, for like more than 30 years. So this is a very uh, like big group of many is like graduates, undergraduates, post, um, uh, master, I mean, PhD students as well as uh, postdocs. I also joined as a postdoc in this lab where I'm working right now. And uh, th these are some uh, pictures of uh, our lab activities, uh, like what we usually like, the way we work, the way we go, like, like sports, recreation, so uh, different. Uh, so this is a picture like students celebrating my birthday. So these are the different, and these are the some of uh, like couple of uh, like recent uh, PhD graduates who uh, worked with me in the last uh, few years. So this is the laboratory where I'm uh, working right now. So basically, yeah, this ends my today's talk. And uh, what you definitely won't understand is what's written over here. This is called Domo uh, Arigato Gozaimasa. So this is a Japanese term for thank you. So now uh, you can, uh, I think uh, we are very close to ending the session. So uh, you, you are free to ask me if you have any kinds of doubts or if you have any kinds of you know confusions or questions regarding this. Thank you, Dr. Chakravarti, uh, for a wonderful lecture. I am sure anyone will be eliminated with your talk. Now, I the participants to please uh, post their questions in the chat box uh, so that you can. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, I would like to say one more thing that I know uh, I've been deliberately a bit fast while talking, <laughs> giving the, the presentation. So many of you might not uh, uh, have understood, understood the entire thing in its entirety, but it doesn't matter because you see, I. The purpose of this lecture wasn't to show you that what data I have or what kind of uh, reaction, uh, uh, like research uh, details of what kind of research we do. The purpose was to show that how we combine different uh, fields of you know science, combine them with a with the purpose of identifying a, a new enzyme. So uh, yeah, let me first address some of the questions. Oh, okay, I think. Oh, okay, okay. There are no more questions until now. I think so, right? If I'm not mistaken. Can you please confirm? Because uh, I'm not much used to with uh, Google. Yeah, I don't think there are, uh, there are messages. Okay. Anyway, so no questions have come. Uh, so I think I would request the participants if anyone has any questions to please write down in the chat box. Yeah, but at the same time, I would uh, like to mention that uh, I'm just rather putting my uh, email ID here. So the students or participants, anybody would, if they would like to uh, know more about this, they can anytime just feel free to write me. Uh, oh, that would be nice. Okay, so it's actually a very uh, long uh, extension of email. <laughs> so it's but, but you, you won't be able to memorize it. It's, bit, it's better that if you write it down. And uh, it's not necessary now, but anytime if you uh, have any queries regarding this, uh, just feel free to uh, just drop me an email and I would like to explain or, or would like to get back to you on this.
Okay, just in the meantime, uh, students or participants ask uh, some questions. Just I want to uh, know one thing, uh, uh, yes. Is there a reason that uh, uh, thermophilic bacteria are having a uh, lesser number of risky oxygenases? Yes, uh, you see, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good question actually. That is one of the questions that also made me think when I started uh, working with these, uh, you know, uh, risky oxygenases. See, first thing is risky oxygenases are very much involved in in transformation of uh, you know, this kind of aromatic hydrocarbons, right? But what happens with, uh, and, and these aromatic hydrocarbons, they mostly come from, uh, you know, like uh, uh, petroleum contaminations and say, uh, uh, like for example, this kind of lignin uh, derived aromatic hydrocarbons, those which I'm working these days, they come from plant-based, you know, plant uh, remains or plant, uh, uh, like denaturation or something. So what we suspect is that uh, most of these uh, uh, thermophiles, they are uh, isolated from, uh, of course, like temperatures as high as like 100 degrees or so. Firstly, uh, in many, most of the cases, uh, uh, these, the, the organisms, they do not come in much contact with this kind of, uh, you know, uh, compounds which can be processed with risky oxygenases yeah. because risky oxygenases they are mostly uh, involved in transformation of you know like poly polyhydroxy uh, like polyaromatic hydrocarbon compounds or this kind of phenolic compounds but rather what we found were some of the ris risky oxygenase homologs that we actually found among the among the uh, thermophiles we suspect that most of those would be uh, involved in uh, compounds, uh, I mean, in demethylation, or we call it O-demethylation, that is replacing the methoxy group with the hydroxy group. Why the, these enzymes have evolved in thermophiles like this, this is just a hypothesis because we are still working on that, is that only uh, kind of like aromatic uh, contaminants, or I won't say contaminants, the, the aromatic compounds that these compound come in contact with are the plant remains, like for example, lignin degraded products and that, because we often see that when we go to some kind of you know hot springs, so there are uh, like different, although the some uh, uh, organic contaminants of organic compounds and some plants which are, yeah, the plants yeah. which are growing and they sometimes get in contact with the uh, you know this water and all. So at high temperatures, lignin degradation occurs very fast. So yeah. this is how the compounds, these organisms, they quite often they come in contact with lignin derived aromatics, like for example, say. Uh, say like uh, polyhydroxybenzoates, uh, polyhydroxy, yeah, uh, polyhydroxybenzoates or say vanillates, so syringic acid, so this kind of compound. So most of the, the of the risky oxygenases that we have found in in these uh, organisms, uh, thermophiles, are little bit different than the mesophilic counterparts, because mesophilics are more like, for example, benzoate, toluate, uh, naphthalene. Uh, financing this kind of uh, risky oxygenases, but these have evolved a bit differently. So uh, these days we are actually also working on the evolution of thermophilic risk, risky oxygenases uh, in a very specific way. Yeah, I think some uh, questions have uh, okay. Ah, okay. It's a very good question. I think do production of biofuel will increase hunger risk? How to produce? Okay, how to produce a lot of biomass that has always uh, this actually has always been a you know uh, debating issue. For example, that, uh, but I don't think so. Personally speaking, I don't think so. Although I'm not an economist, but still, for example, let's put it in this way: when we are producing biofuel, what is the purpose of producing biofuel? Is that we are actually uh, uh, running out of natural fuel, right? We, and we all know that. So all, of course, we need to have some kind of uh, alternative. So that is one of the prime purpose of biofuels. Second, why biofuels is important and interesting is that, you know, uh, biofuels are, the, the, what is the source of biofuels? That is biomass. And biomass is, all, is kind of abundant all around. Just what we need is we need to channelize the biomass in a most efficient way. And that is what I would say in the last couple of decades, uh, science researchers have been working on because uh, people have tried different sources of biomass starting from, you know, this, this uh, uh, syringe uh, uh, grass and then uh, different kinds of uh, plant sources. 
uh different kinds of molasses and now people are uh, now gradually so so initially uh, the methods we call it we used to call it first generation biofuels but those were eco uh, you know economically not very much feasible so then came the second generation biofuels which is actually this bioethanol that uh, i was talking about so bioethanol uh, production is kind of more uh, uh, economically friendly the only thing is need we need to do is we need to optimize the initial bio uh, the, the, the process and that's why still people are looking for most ideal resources and that is where i am also working these days because lignin which is very much abundant and is the most abundant you know uh, i would say uh, polymer in this world because plants are all around so this and when i say plants it's not just cutting down woods plants means any resource of plants it can be forest or whatever, like uh, um, bush or whatever. So this kind of lignin, uh, if we can develop very efficient methods to extract, you know, uh, the, the the monomers from lignins, they can be efficiently used for uh, as a source for bioethanol because lignin is the most abundant. But until now, what makes it difficult is it's difficult to get separate lignin from you know cellulose and all that. So, so this is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, I just made one mistake. I, I meant cellulose. So the only uh, difference, cellulose is the most abundant. So what makes it difficult is that it, it always is accompanied with, with lignin. And this lignin actually hinders in between. So these days we are working on uh, uh, methods or, or enzymatic systems which can be used to degrade the lignin part. So if we can do that, we can uh, uh, efficiently use the the we can more efficiently use the cellulosic part for bioethanol production so that is the i would say very long term goal of our research but until now we are just focusing into you know integration of lignin derived aromatics so from uh, i mean harnessing those compounds from lignin so do they act on uh act on pah so uh Okay, by pH, I, I I guess I hope you mean polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Yeah. Uh, so uh, although I don't uh, I didn't understand what you mean here by they, but if you are meaning uh, this kind of thermo enzymes, then definitely of course they they, they do. For example, this risky oxygenase uh, that we have identified, we are we are, although we are in verge of like in, in the process of uh, characterizing that enzyme. But this enzyme uh, definitely it can it can transform some of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that we have seen so far, but not very efficient because as I said that they might have evolved slightly differently towards lignin derived aromatics. But of course they can uh, transform. Uh, bioplastic bottle need any substance to degrade or no? You see nothing can degrade by itself, right? Whatever we see is getting degraded is always microbiologically unless it is chemical, say like. Uh, through uh, through photolysis or, or something like aerial oxidation but apart from photo oxidation or aerial oxidation usually it's always enzymatic so bioplastic bottles that are being manufactured these days and uh, we uh, although you know there is a catch that although we we say that these are biodegradable but biodegradable word is kind of catchy because it's not always like we just dispose them off and they will be vanished within a couple of months no they also take a lot of uh, time so that also is being done these days to optimize uh, these degradation methods as well. So of course, yeah. So so uh, as your answer, I would say that definitely not itself. It is always enzymatically usually. Uh, yes. Can we make biofuel in future against petroleum or diesel? And and, and uh, as I said at the very beginning, of course, this is what is the main goal of uh, one of the goal of uh, green chemistry. That one uh, someday or the other we completely might have to switch towards biofuel because we won't be left with uh, any more you know this natural gas and uh, you, many of you might be knowing this these, these days especially in countries like united states they have increased biofuel blend to 40% uh, I, I don't remember the the companies which are actually doing the blend of bio, biofuel and natural fuel so gradually the companies are trying to and the government also is trying to increase the biofuel level and decrease the you know natural food and in india also uh, i think shell or bp uh, have, have taken the initiative to to add biofuel plants in some of their um, uh, fuels so i think until now it has been made uh, exclusively for you know aviation purpose not for the not for this uh, automobile uh, that we uh, use uh, in our day to day life 
so that's it okay so finally i would again like to thank you uh especially uh alam for uh okay just, uh, just wait a minute wait a minute then uh, just uh, let us uh, uh just uh, finish our session yeah, yeah of course of uh, course i'm uh, not uh, leaving <laughs> okay that's 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 a jacket just go ahead with your Okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Um, Jadip Chakravarti. I think uh, the problem is that uh, in this talk, we are having the MSc students only. Uh, uh, we, in our department is new, so we lack uh, researchers. So okay. maybe that's one of the reasons why the questions have come uh, in lesser number. No, no, no. Uh, I think the question is very much uh, like practical also, because you see, like when we were doing masters, we were also unaware of the things, right? <laughs> so how things do uh, work. So that's why one of the reasons I wanted, like, uh, although I didn't know about this, otherwise I would have uh, skipped some of the slides which were too much you know experience oriented so but the overview was like just to give them the message that actually how uh, things are happening in the, in the practical world and how things are getting done because soon sooner or later I think soon they will be moving towards their PhD so they can also uh, choose their career path like which way they would like to no, I think your slides were uh, simple and lucid it was uh, quite uh, illuminating also um, I think if you have time, can you share something about that? As you said, some career opportunities in Japan. So, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, I, let me see. I think I had one slide regarding that. Okay. So just let me quickly uh, share one slide, uh, yeah. which uh, fortunately I have with me right now. This is just to give a given uh, overview of uh, the the high studies in Japan. Okay, so as, yeah, you can see here. So, uh, but uh, later on I will also. Uh, okay, uh, when I explain, meanwhile I would like uh, the students to note down this. Uh, address so this is my web page and if you visit this uh, address you can get to know more uh, about this in, in, in detail so basically to be uh, very like in a very short there are actually five types of higher uh, learning in japan these three uh, you don't have to worry about the thing because you are now doing masters so you need to worry about like for undergraduate uh, i mean this one the graduate schools that is for masters and doctoral programs so uh, the system is a little different in Japan because when you come to Japanese or when you apply to Japanese universities, you actually need to go through uh, some, uh, an entrance examination by some uh, Japanese university. It is called actually the Japanese University Admission for International Students, or in short, EJ. It is conducted twice a year, usually in June and November. I think this year it was little unusual because of this, uh, you know, this COVID and all that. So uh, they have this. Um, um, there are various test centers across, especially across Asia, and of course in our uh, India as well. I think in Kolkata also they have. So for this, it's better always if you contact a Japanese embassy because these tests. Uh, one of the methods is to uh, apply through Japanese embassy. So you just need to uh, appear for. You need to uh, consult some uh, some some PhD mentor, and you need to write a a short project proposal and then you need to apply and once you apply you have to go through uh, uh, two rounds of uh, you know entrance and if you can clear then you will um, be chosen for uh, you know this, this either masters or doctoral program which you also uh, you are already doing masters of course doctoral programs and in doctoral program there are there are normally two uh, fellowships one is called jaso fellowship and the most uh, popular one is mixed fellowship so this is very prestigious as well so it is provided by the ministry of education culture and sports of uh, japan so this is the uh, uh, fellowship that is always uh, actually uh, taken by students uh, while applying for you know this uh, post i mean uh, masters uh, and uh, masters how to say this career in, in japan so uh, just let me again type this message in the in the message box so that you can just keep a note of it. You can just copy it and you can visit because uh, I think the web page has a lot more details and more links which can. A couple of years back, I wrote this 
uh, article because I've been receiving a lot of emails from students uh, across, like uh, in, from Indian subcontinent. So that is, was the time that, uh, because this is very obvious, because when I was in India, I also never knew how things, because in other countries, we still have idea because we have seniors, we have relatives, friends, but when it comes to Japan, we hardly see people working here in Japan. So when I came here, I also had a lot of questions. So you can just have a look into the, the, the website and you can, I hope you will be able to get a lot of answer from there. And apart from that, whenever you have any queries, especially students, you can just uh, drop me a message or email. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think one more question has come up. Uh, it uh, says, uh, PHA, uh, yeah, PHA mm -hmm. as it is produced from some bacteria can substitute entire non degradable plastics. Uh, that actually is very difficult to say right now, you know, because of course, like more than last 10 or 12 years, people have been extensively working in, in, in uh, identifying new uh, strains. Uh, they have done a lot of genetic engineering to, to generate, uh, you know, this kind of uh, engineered strains which can produce more and more pH but uh, personally I mean honestly speaking I don't think uh, this is going to happen anytime sooner but uh, we should be optimistic that maybe sometime it will come that uh, but the thing is uh, yeah things are changing because even if, if I look back like 10 or 20 years back and if I see now we have switched a lot towards biodegradable uh, or rather uh, as a whole we see them bioplastics so that's a good thing because hopefully this will keep increasing as a lot and more and more research has been conducted in, in conducted in this field i think this will be solved in, in maybe like 10 or 20 years from now okay uh, thank you dr chakravarti uh, now i think uh, we have come to the end of the session now i would request my colleague uh, dr mehboob uh, to give the word of thanks over to you Mr. dr mehboob okay. just a minute just okay uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zakir Hussain. Okay, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all. Uh, my name is Mehboob Haq, and it is uh, a great honor and privilege for me to propose the vote of thanks for the eighth talk of the series, Bioelimination. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, my heartfelt gratitude and thanks to Dr. Jaydeep Chakraborty, uh, our eminent speaker of the day, for accepting our invitation uh, and be available for the talk despite his very busy schedule. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chakraborty, for your thank very you. informative and enlightening talk on the green chemistry and the role of microbes, uh, which I'm sure will be very helpful for the budding researchers. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, my heartfelt thanks. Uh, my heartfelt thanks uh, to our honourable Vice Chancellor, Professor Muhammad Ali sir, uh, like, uh, for his constant guidance and support. And I would like to also extend my uh, gratitude to the Register of Aliyah University, Dr. Sayyid Nurus Salam, for being with us uh, in every aspect of, uh, like uh, from the beginning of this program and supporting us. I, I also thank uh, Professor Mehdi Kalam, sir, uh, for his constant support and encouragement. Uh, now, my special thanks uh, and heartfelt gratitude to the head of the department, Department of Biological Sciences, Dr. Masrur Alam, uh, who is the chairman of the Bioillumination, uh, for his uh, constant effort to make uh, this uh, entire series successful. And the special thanks to Dr. Alam for inviting such an uh, eminent speaker, Dr. Chakraborty, for today's talk. Uh, uh, my special thanks to Dr. Savdar Ali uh, for conceptualizing the Bioillumination from the beginning and is, who is the convener of this program. Uh, and who has been uh, with taking care of the technical part of today's program. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ali, for your effort and hard work. Uh, my special thanks to Dr. Muhammad Zakir Hussain, the moderator of today's program. Uh, thank you for your nice and hassle-free moderation of today's program. Uh, special thanks and gratitude to Professor Vishana Chakraborty, who unfortunately could not join us uh, in this program as he has some uh, dry commitment but his constant support and motivation always helps us moving ahead with more and more enthusiasm uh, lastly my special thanks to all the uh, colleagues of my department uh, especially dr mudassar huda dr sheik kabita and dr sheik muhammad abu imam Saadi for their support and help uh, 
now the most important part of a program that is the participants so so all dear participants who have joined from different parts of the country as well as our students uh, from the department uh, thank you so much for showing interest and registering in a great number and turning up in the program uh, thank your program and active participation is uh, like the encouragement for the bio elimination thank you so much uh, now i would like to take this opportunity that the feedback form for today's program will be shared by email as well as uh, we'll share the link for our upcoming say uh, upcoming talk that will be held on uh, 31st of uh, october as we are going we are skipping the uh, next week's talk because we are having the festival uh, durga puja that is why we are skipping the next week's talk and we are going to have our talk on 31st of october uh, i wish uh, you all and i request you all to uh, register for the upcoming program as well uh, thank you once again all of you uh, for attending this program and active participation for this program thank you so much thank you dr mahbub uh, i think it's the end of the session uh, now over to you masrur alam uh, will there be any okay just i will request uh, all the participants to please uh, leave the meeting just so we will have some uh,